which consisted of six. Oh, you were okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I just realized. Right. Uh, the, the mobile striking force consisted of six heavy aircraft carriers and their escorts, capable of launching a coordinated aerial attack with over 400 torpedo bombers, dive bombers, and fighters. No other Navy was able to operate more than two carriers in a single group, and even then without any coordination between the two aircraft carriers. The devastation wrought by the immobile striking force on December 7th illustrated just how effective the Imperial Japanese Navy was. But it's critical to remember that for a variety of reasons, none of the three US aircraft carriers, indeed the only ones that the US Navy had in the entire Pacific Ocean, were actually in Pearl Harbor that fateful morning. The destruction by the, wrought by the Japanese on the eight battleships at Pearl Harbor meant the US Navy had little choice but to develop its future around these three carriers. As it turned out, the aircraft carrier took the place of the battleship as the dominant force during the Pacific War. After the Pearl Harbor attack, Japanese forces ran wild across the South Pacific and the Eastern Indian Ocean. By the beginning of spring 1942, Japan had largely achieved its strategic goals. Seizing the oh-so-critical oil fields of the Dutch East Indies from the Dutch, taken Hong Kong, Malaya, and Singapore from the British, captured the Philippines, Wake Island, and Guam from the United States, and wiped out British, Dutch, Australian, and US naval forces in the Central and South Pacific. As you might imagine, Japanese morale was through the roof. More importantly, Imperial Japanese Navy leadership believed its forces were vastly superior to anything its enemies could throw at them. This view later became known as victory disease, a sense of superiority that led the Japanese to, believe, to belittle the US Navy, to believe its opponent was incapable of stopping whatever the Japanese wanted to accomplish. This is what this map shows you the extent to which uh, Japan was successful early in the first few months uh, during the war. So the question was, what are the Japanese to do now? Their initial set of attacks have been so successful. What's the next step? As they saw it, they had basically five choices, none without some difficulties. First, invade Australia in order to prevent the United States from Britain from using it as a base for counterattacks against the Japanese perimeter. The Japanese army, which had a terrible relationship with the Japanese Navy, rejected that plan as drawing too many resources away from its principal area of concern, the continuing war in China. Second choice would be to move southeast in this direction, take Samoa, Fiji, and so forth and thereby cut off Australia as a staging area for the Allies. Or move east towards Hawaii. Or move west towards India. And eventually, it would be hoped to hook up with the Germans, advancing somewhere uh, in the um, uh, Suez Canal area and, and the Middle East. And fifth, Go on the defensive, build a thick shell defense around its new empire. The debate within the Japanese military generally, and within the Japanese Navy in particular, was intense on this subject. As was the case with the US Navy, Japanese Naval Organization had a general headquarters in charge of the entire Navy and a commander in chief handling the ships and equipment of the Japanese fleet. The man depicted here, Admiral Isoruko Yamamoto. Yamamoto believed strongly that the only way to win the war against a much more powerful United States was to make the cost of victory too high for the Americans, driving them to the negotiating table. In Yamamoto's view, accomplishing this goal necessitated the destruction of US aircraft carriers. 
which had been engaged for the first few months of 1942 in pinprick raids against Japanese island positions. He argued for an attack that would force the US carriers to respond, whereupon they could be sunk by aircraft from the mobile striking force. Yamamoto was not the least bit shy about using brutal political tactics within the Navy. Do it my way or I'll quit. That was basically how he got approval for the Pearl Harbor raid. All of his plans and the objections thereto were resolved largely by April of 1942. But any further debate ended with the carrier born April 1942 Doolittle B 25 bomber raid. This assault, which to be honest was nothing more than another pinprick, differed from other US attacks as it was on the Japanese homeland and put the godlike emperor of Japan at risk. Now even the army, which was otherwise opposed to Yamamoto's ideas, was willing to set aside its disagreements and contribute troops, troops to the effort. The question was what target would force the Americans to come out and fight. Midway came to mind as Japanese planners thought that its proximity to the Hawaiian Islands and Pearl Harbor meant the Americans would have no choice but to respond to a Japanese attack and invasion there. Yamamoto, however, wasn't all powerful in the Japanese Navy. He had been forced as a price for the agreement on Midway to agree to a simultaneous attack on the Alaskan Aleutian Islands using other Japanese Navy ships and smaller aircraft carriers. Why there, you may ask? Well, Alaska was used by the United States as a base for sending military equipment to the Soviet Union, then engaged in its titanic struggle with Germany. <laughs> Actually, Atu and Kiska Islands in the Aleutians would interdict that supply chain. Japan and the Soviet Union were not at war but cutting off the Alaska to Siberia supply pipeline would aid Japan's ally, Germany, and create another barrier against any US advance against Japan here in the North Pacific Ocean. Now the Aleutians attack is another a source of another myth surrounding the Battle of Midway. The idea that it was intended merely as a ruse to draw out the US fleet from Pearl Harbor. It was always intended as a separate standalone operation. And before then, in another decision that can only be described as overreaching, the Japanese Navy was asked to support an invasion of Port Moresby in Southeast New Guinea. The two newest aircraft carriers in the six carrier mobile striking force, the Shikaku and the Jukaku, were assigned to protect that invasion. Japanese planners saw no problem as the two would be back in time to rejoin their four sister carriers before the mobile striking force and other Japanese Navy elements left for the midway attack. Now the Japanese plan for midway and for that matter, the Aleutians was complicated, not the least bit unusual for Japanese naval planning. The overwhelming majority of the major ships in the Japanese Navy engaged in one area or another. Now I want you to notice the position of the first carrier striking force on this map. It essentially is all by itself. It's the topmost arrow right here, moving to this, there's Midway. It's all by itself. It has six carriers, the original plan, two battleships, two cruisers, uh, a light cruiser and 11 destroyers. That was the weapon that the uh, Navy, the Japanese Navy expected would defeat any US aircraft carriers that would show up. These ships represent the entirety of the Japanese forces that eventually engaged in fighting, were engaged in fighting the US Navy ships that opposed them. Every other Japanese vessel, and there were a ton of them, as you can see from these other arrows, were simply too far away to assist in the fighting to come. This knowledge will help us deal with the myth that the American Navy was hopelessly outnumbered. Now Yamamoto's, Yamamoto's hope is that the two southernmost groups of ships down here would be discovered 
by U.S. search planes operating in the area, thus causing U.S. aircraft carriers in Pearl to move northwest to attack them. When these aircraft carriers arrived, they would be jumped on by the mobile striking force. In addition, there were uh, substantial invasion, land invasion troops. Uh, the red box here represents them. Their job was to land on Midway once its airfield was neutralized uh, and its defenses uh, weakened and take the island or the atoll, atoll away from the Americans. The Japanese plan included some features that need to be understood. First, there was to be a line of submarines across the path to Midway to detect and hopefully attack those US carriers as they steam northwest out of uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. In addition, long range scouting planes were to search Pearl Harbor to verify that the US carriers had indeed left port in response to the Japanese attack on Midway. These scouts, not having a sufficient range, needed to be refueled. So the plan was that a Japanese submarine with uh, aircraft fuel would be at a tiny atoll called French Frigate Shoals in the middle of this map to refuel them. So they could then conduct the search and have enough fuel to get home. Now, put simply, Yamamoto and his planners expected that once the Japanese attack was launched on Midway, the US carriers would leave in a hurry and move Northwest to defend Midway. In short, the plan is based on the belief that the US will dance to the Japanese tune, responding to each Japanese move in a way that the Japanese expect. A degree of arrogance here, and this arrogance was perhaps best demonstrated when senior Japanese officers, not these guys, these were British, I believe, or American, I'm not sure which, but they're doing the same sort of thing. They're war game. They're testing a plan to see if there are any weaknesses or any flaws anything that can be fixed. This is, was an accepted method for, war, for military planning. But in the two times that the Japanese uh, senior officers did the war games, the possibility of the US Navy showing up in unexpected places during the battle were sum summarily dismissed by the war game umpire. Now, two events got in the way of the Japanese plan. One is the Battle of Coral Sea which we will now turn. Quite honestly, this naval battle itself deserves a class of its own. It's, as I mentioned before, the first time in history when two fleets have fought each other without any surface ship seeing an enemy surface ship. Everything was done by aircraft. The fighting started when three US carriers, sorry, yes, three US carriers interfered with the ships uh, being moved by the Japanese Navy and the Japanese Army to invade Port Moresby in New Guinea. Now, neither side did themselves particularly proud during this swirling and confusing battle. The Japanese had those two new carriers, Shokoku and Zukoku, from the Pearl Harbor attack, plus a third smaller carrier. The U.S. had the Yorktown and the Lexington. The Battle of Coral Sea was a tactical victory for the Japanese, in that the Lexington was sunk and the Yorktown severely damaged, with the Japanese losing only that one small carrier. But Coral Sea was a strategic victory for the US, since the Japanese plan for taking Port Moresby was canceled. Moreover, the fighting had one other serious consequence. The fighting rendered both of the two Japanese carriers incapable of joining their four sisters on the Midway attack. One had lost so much of its aircraft and pilots, and the other was so badly damaged as to be needing months of repair. Oddly enough, the Battle of Coral Sea gave Japanese naval leaders a boost of confidence. They believed that both the Lexington and the Yorktown had been sunk, which caused their estimate as to the number of American aircraft carriers to drop to no more than two, possibly three. Moreover, if the two newest carriers in the Imperial Japanese Navy with less experienced pilots could achieve such a victory, imagine what the four more senior aircraft carriers and their uh, pilots could do. 
I said there were two events that impacted the Japanese plan for Midway. The second was the fact that the Navy's intelligence unit at Pearl Harbor, led by this man, Commander Joseph Rochefort, who frankly is one of my heroes, had developed the ability to read some of the Japanese Navy's most secret communications. During the spring of 1942, analysis of these Japanese communications led Rochefort to conclude the Japanese Navy was planning a large attack somewhere in the late May to early June timeframe. Decoded Japanese messages talked about an assault on a target called AF, a code word Rochefort had ferreted out earlier, knew, stood for, uh, knew, knew that stood for the Midway Atoll. But his superiors in Washington believed Hawaii or Alaska or Samoa or even the west coast of the United States could well be the target. Rochefort and his team came up with a neat trick to confirm Midway was the objective. Using a secure underwater cable that couldn't be uh, overheard by anybody from Pearl Harbor to Midway, he ordered the Midway base to broadcast an uncoded radio message that its water desalinization plant had broken down. The expectation was that the Japanese monitoring US radio messaging would hear this dispatch and let higher command know about Midway's water shortages. Sure enough, the Pearl Harbor decoders themselves picked up and read a subsequent Japanese message to the effect that AF had no fresh water supply. And thus the invaders would have to bring their own equipment to get water. AF was midway. Commander Chester Nimitz, the man you see here, had been named at the end of 1941 as commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet to replace Admiral Husband Kimmel, who commanded the Pacific Fleet, Fleet and was blamed, fairly or not, for the Pearl Harbor debacle. Although we had little experience with either battleships or aircraft carriers, being a submariner, Nimitz was highly regarded in the Navy. He was, of course, Yamamoto's counterpart. So Nimitz knows the Japanese target is Midway. What could or should he do with this information. He believed that notwithstanding the US Navy's comparative inferiority in resources, it would be possible to set up a sneak attack on the approaching Japanese, an ambush that might level the uneven balance of power in the Pacific. He had two carriers at Pearl, the Enterprise and the Hornet. The damaged Yorktown was returning from the fighting at Coral Sea. He could use all of them against the Japanese steaming towards Midway. This is the last page of Op Plan 29-42, Nimitz's orders to the commanders of the two US Navy task forces set out to take on the advancing Japanese. Nimitz knows full well the Japanese have far greater resources than does he, but it's convinced that the intelligence windfall Rochefort and his team might even the odds to the point of enabling the US victory to score a Navy to score a victory. But the direction that he gives his commanders is not the equivalent of a suicide charge. If they determine that an attack would be foolhardy, they are to retreat. At a fundamental level, Nimitz knows he will be able to take Midway back later, even if the Japanese do capture it. But he won't be able to do that if he loses both Midway and the aircraft carrier. Arriving at Pearl Harbor on May 27, 1942, Yorktown is, was in need of what should have been a three month repair job when it arrived. Nimitz required her for the forthcoming battle. So he directed that round the clock repairs be completed as best as possible in three days. 1400 men went to work basically for 72 hours straight. The work had to be somewhat slapdash but the repairs were enough to render Yorktown fit for fighting again. She left for Midway on the 30th of May, the day behind the Enterprise in the Hornet. Nimitz had directed the three US carriers and the cruisers and destroyers accompanying them 
to a point northeast of Midway, uh, labeled somewhat optimistically as Point Luck, to be in a position on the flank of the Japanese as they approached Midway. He also sent a hodgepodge of aircraft to Midway itself, since it was effectively an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Its single airport had nearly 100 fighters and bombers, along with 31 long-range search planes. Finally, U.S. Marines were dispatched to set up ground defenses, including heavy cannons and anti-aircraft guns, all around Midway in order to thwart the expected invasion. The stage was set. Both sides were moving into position. Let's take a minute and meet the people involved. We've already met the head of the overall Japanese combined fleet, Admiral Yamamoto, the man on the left. Commanding the mobile striking force, strike force, is Admiral Nagumo Chiuchi. He's got these four carriers. Two of them are commanded by Admiral Yamaguchi Tamon, the man in the upper right corner. Two uh, lesser ranking officers who are critical to the air operations. Genda Minoru, who is the air officer on Nagumo's staff, and was responsible for the preparation of the air attack portion of the Midway plan. And on the lower right, uh, Fuchida Mitsuo, the overall commander of the aircraft which had assaulted Pearl Harbor, and the man who was expected to lead the Japanese aircraft for the initial assault on Midway itself. The two task forces, one with the Enterprise and Hornet and escorts, and one with the Yorktown, the first is commanded by the man on the right, Blank, uh, Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher. The task force with the Yorktown was commanded by Raymond Spruance. Fletcher had considerable experience with aircraft operations, aircraft carrier operations, while Spruance had virtually none. But Spruance had worked effectively as commander of cruisers for Admiral William Halsey, who had come down with a debilitating skin condition and was thus unable to participate in the midway action. Halsey had recommended Spruance as his temporary replacement to Nimitz. Here's the focus of the action. This is actually, as I mentioned, Midway is an atoll. It's actually two little islands with a land, bain, land plane base on the nearer island, Easter island, Eastern Island, and a seaplane base on Sand Island in the background. As you can see, there must have been a jam-packed bunch of airplane parking lots on Eastern Island to hold 100 airplanes. This picture is from November of 41, so it was before this action. I would love to see a picture of it, but I've never been able to find one. Here's that Japanese plan again. A couple of things have happened. That Japanese submarine picket line I mentioned a while ago, it was supposed to be in place to detect and attack the US carriers. Its deployment was delayed for no particular reason other than just it was delayed. And as a result, it got in place well after those carriers from Pearl Harbor had moved past. So those submarines saw nothing. Rochefort's decoders had also ferreted out the Japanese plan to use French frigate shoals as a refueling base for search planes looking over Pearl Harbor. Nimitz foiled that plan by keeping a few small ships in the uh, French frigate shoals area to prevent any refueling from taking place. The Japanese search plan had to be canceled. No information would be available about what ships were at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese, in fact, had no idea where the American carriers were, but their planning was based on their being at Pearl Harbor. So there they must be. Here are the four carriers in the mobile striking force. Hear you, upper left, Soryu, upper right, Kaga, and Akagi. They held in all 20, 225 planes mixed between the incomparable Japanese fighter, the Zero, Val dive bombers, and Kate torpedo bombers. These names were given to these aircraft by the US Navy. Now, these four carriers were in fact capable of carrying as many as 267 planes in all, but limited Japanese plane manufacturing capacity reduced aircraft availability. And of course, the Zukuku and Shokuku were not there. They would have added another 100 plus planes to the fight. 
as they had on December 7th. Here are the three US carriers, Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown. Although there were only three of these carriers versus four Japanese, the, these three carriers actually carried more planes, about 238 versus the 225 for the Japanese carrier. A quick note about aircraft. On the carriers there are, for the Japanese, there are three basic types of airplane. The Zero fighter plane, upper, upper left. The Kate or Nakajima torpedo bomber, upper right. And the Aichi or Val dive bomber at lower right. The Zero was light, incredibly maneuverable, heavily armed with two cannons in the wings, but vulnerable. It had no self-sealing fuel tanks, no armor plating to protect the pilots. It was used to combat enemy aircraft. Both of the bombing planes, the Kate and the Val, could be equipped with anti-ship munitions or with bombs for land targets. The Japanese at this point in the war had the best, fastest, and longest range torpedo, and indeed much better than the US torpedo, which often wouldn't even explode. Here are the three planes that you would find on US aircraft carriers. The Dauntless dive bomber, the F-4F Wildcat fighter, and the Devastator torpedo bomber. The Devastator is simply obsolete. It's too slow, it's too poorly protected. When carrying a torpedo, it can barely get to 100 knots or about 115 miles an hour of airspeed. The Wildcat, the fighter plane, can hold its own with the Zero but only if it avoids dogfighting, that swirling kind of combat you see uh, in the movies, because it's, it's anywhere near as maneuverable as the uh, Zero. The plane on the upper left, the Dauntless Dive Bomber, is a newer plane with the carriers. It absorbs damage well, and in fact stays uh, on board US carriers until 1944. Now a minute about how these planes get used. The torpedo bomber would launch its torpedoes from very near the surface of the water, while dive bombers would attack from many thousands of feet. These two diagrams give you a rough idea of, of uh, what, what would happen. Notice that the Japanese torpedo bomber is much faster uh, and can drop much further away than the US torpedo bomber. Now, fighter planes that these carriers car carried had two basic roles. The first was to protect friendly ships from attacking incoming torpedo and dive bombers. These planes were known as the Combat Air Patrol, or CAP, CAP for short. The second type of assignment for fighters was to escort friendly bombers to their targets and prevent enemy CAP fighters from going after those bombers. A well coordinated carrier plane attack would have escorting fighters and the torpedo and dive bombers all assault, assault, assaulting simultaneously so as to force what enemy cap there was to split up to deal with the high uh, level flying dive bombers and the low level flying torpedo bombers. Now this is how it was supposed to happen. Reality would be quite different, particularly for the Americans. Here's the picture on the morning of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the morning of June 3rd, as these various Japanese forces are approaching. The US search planes on Midway had discovered the oncoming ships in the Southern portion of the map on the 3rd and had carried out that night or early the next morning, a night torpedo attack that had damaged a single Japanese uh, uh, fuel carrying uh, tanker. The Americans now knew that battle would commence the next day. Understanding what happened at the Battle of Midway also requires some understanding of how aircraft carriers, in particular Japanese aircraft carriers, operated. This is a simplified schematic of the Kaga. Please ignore the arrows and the numbers in the, in the circles. Note that this ship, like all four of the Japanese carriers, has two so-called hangar decks where planes were stored when not in use. In getting planes ready for launching on the topmost 
deck called the flight deck. Except for dive bombers, Japanese practice was to fuel and arm these planes on the hangar decks and then bring them up using one of three elevators on the ship, one at each end and one in the middle. Dive bombers would be fueled on the hangar decks, but would be armed on the flight deck. Once the planes were in position on the flight deck, they would be warmed up for about 15 or so minutes, depending on the temperature. Because Japanese hangar decks were fully enclosed, unlike their American counterparts, these planes could not be warmed up while they're on the hangar deck. Fundamentally, aircraft carriers at this point have three operating modes. They can launch planes, they can land planes, or they can bring planes from the flight deck down to the hangars or up from the hangars. And this is critical to understand. They can only do one of those things at any given time. So much for the preliminaries. The story of the Battle of Midway, the action of its participants, is, the, is complicated by the fact that lots of things are happening in several different locations at more or less the same time. The Japanese force is steaming towards Midway, while the US carriers are lurking off to the north northeast of Midway. And of course, at various points in time, the air forces on Midway and on the carriers become very active. From this point in my presentation, I'm going to add clocks to almost all the slides to emphasize the importance of time to what happened. And I'm going to change to the present tense, well, I'll try to anyway, to give you an idea of the tension facing everyone during the battle. I need to add one other thing that's key to understanding what happened. Air attacks on enemy ships required knowing where those ships were. This meant conducting extensive searches by planes that could fly for an extended period of time. Search plans had to be developed that had a high potential for finding ships in places where they could be attacked. Since weather might be variable depending on location, naval forces would have to devote enough planes to performing searches as to be reasonably certain to find the enemy. As you will see, this factor was a problem for the Japanese Navy. So here we go. On the very early morning of June 4th, 1942, the Japanese carrier force striking force, the uh, Japanese carrier striking force is approaching Midway from the Northwest. Meanwhile, Midway expecting an attack at any time sends off 22 of its long range search planes called Catalinas at 3.55 in the morning. Long before 3.55 in the morning, the crews on these four Japanese the carriers are awake and beginning the arduous process of preparing the air attack for Midway itself. At 4.30 in the morning, from all four of these carriers, roughly in this position, and you can see where the airplanes would assemble after taking off, uh, planes from all four of these carriers form up into one single formation. That process takes about seven minutes, incredibly much faster than US carriers are capable. Yamamoto's instructions to Nagumo, in charge of the mobile striking force, were to reserve 50% of his bombers with anti-ship weapons, torpedoes and anti-ship bombs, just in case, by some chance, there are indeed American ships present near Midway. Nagumo follows this direction, so the Midway attack represents only half of his overall attacking strength. At the same time this is happening, Japanese combat air patrol, or CAF fighters, to protect the carriers take off as well. In addition, from about 4.35 until 5 a.m., Japanese cruisers and battleships, which carry search planes, launch. These are the two types of Japanese search planes. The Nakajima plane at the bottom is an older version, and it's more capable and longer range sister at the top, the Aichi, they were launched between 4.30 and 5 a.m. But the last one, a plane from the cruiser Kone, the number four plane from that cruiser, was late and it didn't leave until five o'clock. Now, of course, the Japanese are not expecting the US Navy to be anywhere near midway at this time. They're supposed to be down in Pearl Harbor. 
and surely they're there. Designed by Commander Agenda, the search and plan, the plan employs only seven search planes with varying search paths, as you can see here. This is less than one third the number of search planes coming from Midway alone. The right hand circle shows the location of the two task forces, two US task forces. The yellow circle is, of course, Midway. Note the path of the search plane labeled as Tone number four. That's this one right here. For some reason, as I mentioned, this plane uh, took off 30 minutes late. One of the myths surrounding the Battle of Midway is that had it launched on time, it would have discovered that uh, one of the US carriers much earlier, enabling the Japanese to send off a big attack. In reality, its initial flight path should have been much longer and would have resulted in discovering the American ships even later than actually happened. You can see that on this map. This search should have gone out to here and then come back. We'll talk more about this search plane in a few moments. As I mentioned, Commander Fuchida was supposed to lead the Japanese attack, but he was very sick. And instead, this rather good looking guy, Lieutenant Tamagana Joichi, was designated, is designated as the leader of the initial strike on Midway. 10 minutes earlier at 4.20 in the morning, the Yorktown had launched 10 of its own planes, Dauntlesses, to conduct a search for the Japanese force. Search conducted to the north, just in case they might be there. These planes don't have bombs, so in order to be useful as a bombing plane, they have to return, get gas and bombs on the Yorktown. However, the remainder of the aircraft on the three US carriers are ready to go. But the question for them is where are the Japanese? At 5.34 in the morning, the searching Catalina from Midway radios that it has found two Japanese carriers and gives their location. 10 minutes later at 5.44 in the morning, another Catalina reports back to Midway that it has spotted a number of planes heading for Midway. This is of course the incoming Japanese attack led by Tomagana. Captain Cyril Simard, in the upper left, had overall command of Midway, including its wide array of planes. Look at all these. There are fighters, torpedo bombers, dive bombers, a twin-engined B-26, oddly enough equipped with torpedoes. It wasn't built for that. And of course, several heavy B-17 bombers. Unfortunately, many of these pilots are green, little experience with the planes they're flying. Japanese mid, I'm sorry, Midway's radar picks up the incoming Japanese planes. Knowing that all of his parked planes are vulnerable, Simard elects to launch all of them. The fighters are designated to jump on the incoming Japanese planes, while the other mixed bag of bombers and torpedo aircraft are ordered to attack Japanese carriers. There's no coordination among these various detachments and they fly off at different speeds. This differential in speed will play a major role as the battle proceeds. Both sides see and report on each other's attacking planes. The Catalina uh, reports have reached the American carriers. Fletcher in overall command orders Spruance to launch an attack on his two carriers, Enterprise and Hornet. But Spruance knows he's too far away from the reported position of the enemy carriers to attack. There's simply not enough range for his aircraft. Worse yet, because the carriers have to be sailing towards the wind, the prevailing wind, in this case, coming from the east, to enable planes to take off, he can only launch planes while he's sailing east, even further away from his targets. So he decides to steam westerly until 7 a.m. when he can then turn and launch his planes into the wind. He also knows his attack aircraft should arrive over the Japanese carriers just about the same time those carriers will be particularly vulnerable as they will have been landing their planes returning from the midway wave. 
For his part, Fletcher on the Yorktown is going to wait until his 4.20 a.m. search returns and then send off his attack plane. At 6.20 in the morning, the incoming Japanese planes arrive at Midway. Initial fighter, U.S. fighter attacks caused several Japanese bombers to be shot down. But once the Zeros Japanese fighters get into the fray, U.S. fighters are severely handled. The Brewster Buffalo, the U.S. fighter based at Midway, almost all of them are shot down. Their performance is so bad that a subsequent report observes that any commander who put them in the air to combat Japanese Zeros may as well consider them lost upon their departure. The Japanese attackers destroy a number of fixed facilities on the two islands. But it is plain a lot of anti-aircraft guns and other gun emplacements are undamaged, and the airfield is still capable of operating. By 635, the Japanese attack is complete, and the Japanese planes begin to form up for their return to their carriers. Knowing that the Midway airfield is still capable of operating, and many defensive installations are undamaged, the Magana reports to Nagumo at 7 a.m. that another air attack on Midway is necessary to allow for a successful invasion. At the same time, the Hornet and Enterprise are finally in position to launch. Neither carrier is anywhere near as talented as their Japanese opponents. Not only does it take them nearly an hour to get them off the carrier flight decks, but Spruance eventually has to order the dive bombers and their escorting fighters to leave before the torpedo bombers can launch, since the former may run out of fuel too early. As a result, the American planes are not the single desired coordinated group, but rather three separate groups with poor communications among everybody. Now we have a new player in our story, the US submarine Nautilus, not by the way, the nuclear sub. By virtue of its assignment in the US submarine search plan, set forth in the lower left here, uh, and its assignment was circled, uh, that, the quadrant was a uh, wedge, was uh, its one that circled in, in blue with midway in red here. Uh, it spotted the main Japanese force coming in from the west north, northwest at 7 a.m. From that time until 8.30, the Nautilus is both detected and attacked by Japanese surface ships, and for its own part, launches four torpedoes at a Japanese battleship. All four miss. There's more, so stay tuned for chapter two of the Nautilus story in a minute. At 7.10, sorry, Ahead of myself. I apologize. There's a slide missing here, and I'm not quite sure why. But let me let me. Uh, I'll just give it to you verbally. At 7:10 in the morning, the first U.S. strike on the carriers from Midway arrives. It's got six new torpedo bomber fighters and four of the B-26 Marauders, which, as I mentioned, were set up with torpedoes. They conduct a poorly coordinated attack on the Japanese carriers. They score no hits. Hang on a second. Hmm. Sorry. They score no hits, and many of the US planes are destroyed, courtesy of 30 Japanese Zeros flying the combat air patrol. One B 26 nearly crashes into Nagumo's ship, the Akagi. And if it had, it would have killed Nagumo and his staff. Contrary to Yamamoto's order, and perhaps due to a combination of Tamagana's advice about the need for a second attack on Midway, and the fact that the plane that nearly killed him was clearly from Midway, Nagumo decides that a second attack on Midway is in order around 7.15. This means dismounting the torpedoes on the reserve torpedo bombers in the hangar deck and replacing them with land bombs. This is a time-consuming multi-step process. The torpedoes have to be unloaded, the torpedo mounting brackets on the airplanes removed and replaced with brackets for land bombs. Then the land bombs themselves 
need to be installed. This effort is going to take roughly an hour and a half to accomplish. Then Naguma will need roughly another hour to bring those planes up to the flight deck, warm them up, and launch them. In the meantime, Tomogonin's returning planes need to be recovered, which will get in, in the way of bringing those rearmed planes up from the hangar decks. Naguma needs time to get all this done. Time is precious now. Does he have enough? Meanwhile, the Japanese searches are not going well. One aborts due to bad weather. The second is either off course or encountering heavy cloud cover because its planned search path should have taken it over the Yorktown. But by 7.15 a.m., they are all on their return legs back to, the, to the, their bases in the cruisers and, and battleships and still haven't found any U.S. ships. Nagumo isn't expecting any, so his decision to change the weapons on his reserve aircraft and go after Midway a second time seems wise. Seems wise. And then at 7.40 a.m., a bolt from the blue. The number four search plane from the Tone reports seeing 10 U.S. ships. But what kind of ships? Why are they there? Is there a carrier with them? And if not, why not? What are they doing there? Gumo immediately stops the change from torpedoes to land bombs on those reserve, air, uh, reserve aircraft, which is taking place now on the Akagi and the Kaga. At 7.53 a.m., before Nagumo has had time enough to decide how to respond to this report, the second U.S. attack arrives. These are 17 Marine Corps Dauntlesses flown by green pilots, most of whom have not even flown the plane until a few days earlier, and some of whom are brand new to the squadron. They were led by Major Lofton Henderson, and they're on the left there. Again, they're no match for the Combat Air Patrol Zeros. Most are shot down with no hits on any Japanese ships. Henderson is killed, but his name graces the US airfield on Guadalcanal later on in 1942. And while these attacks cause no damage to any Japanese carrier, they are disruptive. The Japanese combat air patrol has to land for fuel and ammunition, which ties up the flight deck. The ships themselves have to maneuver, sometimes quite violently, to avoid, avoid torpedoes and bombs from the US planes. This causes the entire Japanese ship formation to become disorganized and to adversely affect the aircraft rearming work in the hangar decks below. A minute later, the third US attack shows up, 12 B-17s, also from Midway, led by Colonel Walter Sweeney. Being B-17s, they're at very high altitude. They had been sent off by Simard from uh, Midway at 6 a.m., as I mentioned, to attack the transports that had been detected the previous day, but they are diverted to go after the carriers. They're too high for the Japanese camp, which is involved anyway with Henderson's squadron, to go after the B-17s immediately. But with that altitude comes a price. The B-17 bombs take 30 seconds to fall to sea level, which gives the Japanese ship captains plenty of time to avoid any hits. But again, this attack prevents any Japanese attack planes from being spotted on the deck. They're still down in the hangar deck. This picture shows the Hiryu under B-17 attack. I think those uh, little dots are the bombs. Uh, had the Hiryu steam straight ahead, some of them might even have hit, but she's able to steer away from it. This is one, these are all pictures taken from the B-17s showing the Akagi steaming to the right, the starboard, to prevent those bombs from hitting. Now, by this time, Tomogonin's strike on Midway has returned, but it can't land during all of these attacks, and the constant landing and takeoffs of cap fighters, so he and his fellow pilots start circling above the fray, unable to assist and waiting for a quiet period to land. At 8.11, the number four search plane reports again, stating that the 10 US ships appear to be five destroyers and five cruisers. This report brings some relief. At least no carriers are reported, but more puzzlement. 
Why are they there if not to protect Harriers? At 8.20 a.m., that sense of relief is shattered. Tony's number four radios another report that changes everything. The 10 U.S. ships appear to be accompanied by an aircraft carrier. This, it turns out, is the York, the Yorktown. Meanwhile, at 840, sorry, 827, the fourth U.S. attack arrives. This is 11 old obsolete Vindicators, Marine uh, planes led by Major Benjamin Norris arriving from Midway. Norris doubts his planes would survive until they reach the carriers, so he decides to attack uh, a, a nearer Japanese battleship, the Haruna. Only two of his unit's planes are shot down, but once again, no hits. This is a schematic showing the remaining planes from Henderson's group departing here, Norris's group approaching, and the B-17s, two different groups attacking two different carriers. Right now, as you see this picture, it's about 8.15. By 8.30, the uncoordinated and clumsy US attacks appear to have been subsided. So now those circling planes from the midway strike can be recovered. This takes about 30 minutes in all. By 9.10, the Japanese carriers begin to prepare for their launch to go after the US carrier located by the Tony number no. four search plane. The, the torpedo bombers are almost certainly ready to go on the hangar deck. So all that needs to happen is to bring them up along with the escort fighters and the dive bombers, blow the dive bombers with bombs which is done, as I mentioned, on the deck, not in the hangar, and then warm them up and then launch. Just a little more time. But the Americans aren't done. At about 8.40, the Yorktown is the last of the US carriers to launch her planes, completed about 9.06. She has recovered the early morning search aircraft that went out at 4.20. Unlike the Hornet and Enterprise, the Yorktown is a comparatively old hand at this, and hence is able to send off the fighters, torpedo bombers, and dive bombers in one cohesive unit. Before Nagumo can get his attack plane spotted on the flight deck, however, for a launch, the fifth US attack arrives. This is about 920. This consists of 15 devastators the old obsolete torpedo bomber I mentioned earlier, from the Hornet, led by this man, Lieutenant Commander John Waldron. His is the first of the American carrier planes to attack. Waldron's squadron had departed the Hornet with the overall commander of the Hornet's attacking planes, Stanhope Ring, but was convinced that Ring was heading in the wrong direction and elected to proceed on his own on a different track. It turned out he was right. Ring's fighters and dive bombers never found the Japanese carriers. Many ran out of fuel and were lost. Others had to land at Midway to avoid the same fate. But as I mentioned, Waldron's 15 planes were the slow devastator. Again, no match for the zeros. There were no covering fighters to ward them off. Eventually, every single one was shot down. With of the 30 air crew on the 15 planes, only one man surviving. Only a few of the devastators were even able to drop their torpedoes. But the torpedoes were too slow and fired too far away from the Japanese carriers. So once again, no hits. The man who survived, Ensign George Gay, you know, Pearl Harbor Hospital, crawling out of his plane, which had crashed in the water with his gunner in the back of the plane dead, Gay was fearful that if he were seen by the Japanese fighters, he would be strafed, machine gunned in the water. So he hid under a seat cushion. It turned out that he had a ringside seat for some spectacular views to come. As it happened with every other American attack, the Japanese carriers were forced to take evasive actions to avoid the few torpedoes fired at them. In addition, it was impossible to launch attack planes while maneuvering so violently. And what aircraft that were launched were cap fighters, which continually needed, as I mentioned, refueling and fresh ammunition. An attack on the American carriers couldn't be set up 
for Rost. Now it's 938 and the sixth US attack from Cuba. This is Eugene Lindsay's devastator torpedo bombers from the Enterprise. Lindsay split his 15, 14 planes into two seven plane formations, hoping to attack the Kaga from both sides at the same time. Initially, there was little Japanese combat air patrol and what there was was out of the very effective cannon shells that the Japanese Zeros carried. But eventually, all but four of the torpedo bombers were shot down, including Lindsay himself. And again, there were no hits. By 7 a.m., what remained of Lindsay's force had left. This is the Lindsay's squadron attack. Now, by this point, the Japanese have shrugged off six separate U.S. air assaults, with most attacking planes being shot down. The Americans have demonstrated much less proficiency than their opponents. It would not be surprising if the Japanese were feeling a little superior to, maybe even a little contemptuous of, their American opponents. Now, 10 a.m., it's time to start bringing those attack planes up from the hangar deck. The Japanese carriers are turned towards the northeasterly wind to allow for takeoff. It will take about 45 minutes in all to launch the counter-strike to take out that U.S. carrier. By 10.45 a.m., all will be well. Just a little more time. Just a little more time. Now, we need to go back and check, this is chapter two, of the U.S. submarine Nautilus. After her failed attack on the battleship Hiroshima at 8.25 a.m., Nautilus's captain, Lieutenant Commander William Brockman, fires a torpedo at a Japanese cruiser, the Nagara, which again misses. The Japanese fleet is moving north. So to keep that pesky US sub from interfering anymore, the Japanese destroyer, the Arashi, is directed to stay behind to deal with the American sub. For the better part of an hour, the Arashi drops depth charges in an effort to sink the US sub without success. At about 9.40 AM, figuring it's done its job, the Arashi departs at high speed in a north-northeasterly direction to rejoin the main Japanese body. At the same time, 10 a.m., two things are happening, happening simultaneously on the American side. First, the coordinated Yorktown strike with torpedo and dive bombers and fighter escorts flying in from the east has spotted the Soryu and Hiryu. Lem Massey, in charge of the Devastator torpedo bombers, leads them on an attack on the Hiryu. In charge of the Dauntless dive bombers, Max Leslie heads to attack the Soryu. Unfortunately, four of Leslie's 13 planes had accidentally dropped their bombs because of a glitch in the electric arming system. So there are only nine dive bombers with, left, with bombs left to drop. Two of the six fighters who came with them are trying to protect the torpedo bombers. The other four are higher up with the man in the lower part of this picture, Jimmy Thatch. He is attacked and his colleagues are attacked by the Japanese cap before he and his colleagues can get down to cover those torpedo bombers. But between them, they shoot down six zeros for the loss of only one wildcat. Twelve. Massey's 12 torpedo bombers are eventually separated from their two fighter plane cover, and 10 are eventually shot down, including Massey, with yet again no hits, this on the hear you. But Thatch is tying up at least a third of the Japanese cat planes, about 40 in all. And flying at high altitude, Leslie's dive bombers are unseen by the Japanese cap and Soryu. Thatch's success against the Zero is despite the fact that his plane is nowhere near as maneuverable as the Zero in dogfighting combat. He has come up with a technique to even the odds, the Thatch weave. It works. Every time a Zero gets on the tail of a wildcat, it and its partner begin to weave. Let me show you what's, what's happening here. Here's my... the Japanese Zero on the tail of a, of a wildcat. 
Here's the Wildcats uh, flight partner. Do this in pairs. Always stay in pairs if you can. The attacked Wildcat goes to its left and then goes to its right. Sorry. Its friend goes to its right and then to its left. And as you can see, what happens is it's then in position to fire on the attacking zero. This is a very effective technique. And as I say, six zeros are shot down. This has never happened before. For the first time, Japanese fighters are unable to have their way with American aircraft, as has been happening all morning long. That's the first thing. The second thing involves this man, Wade McCluskey. He's heading up 33 dive bombers from the Enterprise. They're running low on fuel and can't find the carriers. And then a big break. At 9.55 in the morning, he notices a Japanese destroyer moving rapidly to the north. This, as you may have guessed, is the Arashi, having left its post, pinning down the Nautilus, and now speeding back to the main group. McCluskey reasons it has to be going somewhere important, so he follows. At 10.02 a.m., he radios back to Admiral Spruance that he has spited the enemy. The result of all this is the Japanese carriers are facing a three-pronged attack from dive bombers and torpedo bombers at more or less the same time. Worse yet, the Japanese cap is bunched up in the east and southeast, attacking Massey's low-level torpedo bombers or going after Thatch's fighters. No one sees either group of dive bombers at much higher altitude. Nugumo has run out of time. From about 10.24 to 10.30, just six minutes occurs the single most devastating aerial attack in naval history. Because of a miscommunication between McCluskey and one of his two squadron commanders, Lieutenant Dick Best, the upper left corner, 30 of the 33 Enterprise dive bombers attack one carrier, the Kaga, and only three, led by Best, are able to bomb the Akagi. There should have been an even Steven split, one, one uh, squadron going after one carrier and the other after the second one. The Kaga is hit by at least four bombs and several near misses, which themselves can cause some damage. Akagi, even though it's attacked by only three, three planes, is hit dead center by Best's 1,000 pound bomb. And his two colleagues have each very close near misses, including one that jams her rudder. Max Leslie's dive bombers, those nine that had bombs, go after the Soryu with three hits. Leslie mistakenly believes that another Yorktown dive bomber squadron would be left to attack the Hiryu, but that squadron was in fact left in reserve on the Yorktown. While it took a while, especially in the case of the Akagi, with only the one hit, all three Japanese carriers were doomed to fiery, painful deaths. All of them had dozens of fully fueled and armed planes on their hangar decks. The Akagi and Kaga also had numerous torpedoes in storage racks on the hangar decks. Torpedoes taken off to put on those land bombs and torpedoes that should have been returned to safe storage below, but they weren't. All of this fuel and munitions add to the destruction. The Hiryu on her part is unscathed. Japanese search planes, ones that were uh, launched hours earlier and others are continuing to report on the location of the Yorktown. Hiryu has 18 dive bombers set up as reserves. So along with six fighter escorts, they depart the Hiryu on the double a little before 11 a.m. A bit before noon, Yorktown's radar picks up the incoming Hear You attack and sends Wildcat cap fighters to intercept. Three zeros of the six are shot down, along with 11 of the 18 dive bombers. But showing their high degree of professionalism, the remaining seven dive bombers score three hits and two near misses on the Yorktown, leaving her burning and dead in the water. Because of the damage to the Yorktown, 
Admiral Fletcher, who's on board, has to leave her for the cruiser Astoria around 1.25 in the afternoon. Given his situation, he decides to give overall command of all US ships to Admiral Spruance, who was with the undamaged Enterprise and Hornet. Spruance will be calling the shots for the remainder of the battle. In the meantime, here you frantically puts up a second attack with 10 torpedo bombers and six fighters, all led by Lieutenant Tamagana. One of the fuel tanks on his torpedo bomber was holed during the morning bombing in Midway, meaning he's not likely to get back, even if his plane is not damaged further. He goes anyway. That attack leaves, leaves at about 1.30 p.m. Sometime before, one of Massey's devastator pilots from New Yorktown, Ensign Wesley Osmus, the guy in the upper left, had been plucked from the water by a Japanese ship and interrogated. He, we don't know this, but very likely under some form of torture, revealed that there were in fact three US carriers present, not just the one that had been found. In any case, it was certainly clear to the Japanese commanders that the volume of planes attacking over the morning could not possibly have been from just midway in one aircraft carrier. I should add, Osmos was murdered at the direction of the captain of the ship that picked him up and his body thrown into the ocean. Two other US Navy air crew picked up from the water by the Japanese met the same fate after the battle was over. The guy who was the captain of the Japanese ship was killed later in the war, uh, likely would have been charged with a murder, uh, it's a war crime, but he died anyway. Now the Hiryu's dive bomber attack had left one carrier burning. So it's critical that Tamagana's small group hit an undamaged US carrier. If it can do that, it would be one-to-one. -one. The two American carriers now damaged, one left over, and the Hiryu on the Japanese side. At 2.30, Tamagana's planes find a US carrier, steaming at about 20 knots and apparently in fine form. It meets the definition of an undamaged carrier, so in they go. However, it turns out to be the Yorktown again, which had, been, had undergone some superb damage control. Radar restored and the fire is put out by two o'clock. The boilers are back online by the time Tamagana shows up, allowing it to start steaming at roughly 20 knots. Once again, the Wildcats are summoned to foil the Japanese attack, and they do serious damage, shooting down fighters and five of the Kates, the uh, 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 torpedo bombers, including Tamagana's plane. But yet again, the Japanese demonstrate their skill. They hit Yorktown with two torpedoes around 245. She almost immediately develops a list an abandoned ship is ordered at 3 p.m. The remains of this second attack returns to the Hiryu at about 3.40 in the afternoon. Just before Tamagana sights the, York, sights the Yorktown, U.S. search planes find the Hiryu again at about 2.20 p.m. At 3.25, the Enterprise sends off 15 dive bombers all refugees from Yorktown, and seven more of its own. York, the Hornet was delayed and sent 16 Dauntlesses at about 4 p.m. All of these planes, 38 in all, head for the Hiryu's position. At about 4.45 p.m., they find the Hiryu and launch a not particularly well done attack, but the volume of planes and bombs makes that academic. Hiryu was hit with four 1,000 pound bombs, one from Dick Best, who surely is the only airman in history who successfully bombed two carriers in a single day. And it's turned into a flaming wreck. The last of the four Japanese carriers is out of action. Some of the US planes attack the Japanese battleship Aruna. The late arriving Hornet dive bombers go after two Japanese cruisers and 12 B-17 show up a second time. Six of them are from the Army Air Corps field in Kauai, sent as reinforcements. But everything other than the four hits on the Hiryu is a miss. Hiryu's plan for one last attack on the US carrier's 
with the tiny remnants of its air complement postponed due to pilot exhaustion to 7 p.m., of course, never takes place. This is the Hear You, early morning on the 5th, still burning and abandoned by her survivor. This picture was taken by a Japanese plane flying from a smaller Japanese carrier further west. At this point in time, early morning on the 5th, she's the only Japanese carrier still afloat, but it's obviously doomed. After air operations had concluded around 7 p.m. on the 4th, and his planes were covered, Spruance directs his ships to sail easterly until about midnight, then north for one hour, and then go back west again, all in order to avoid any night surface action with what he knows is a much more powerful enemy, and yet be positioned in the morning to be able to attack with his remaining attack planes, whatever is left of the Japanese in the area. Keep in mind here that although he knows his aviators have done serious, possible fatal, possibly fatal damage to the Japanese carriers, he doesn't know whether they are still afloat, maybe even repaired enough to allow for flight operations or their return to Japan. This is the Yorktown following her abandonment late on the 4th. But this is one tough ship. As she is still afloat on the morning of the 5th, there is hope she might survive a return to Pearl Harbor. Yorktown crewmen, who have been scattered among the US ships accompanying her after the order to abandon ship was given the afternoon before, are returned to the Yorktown to work on temporary repairs. And a seagoing tug is summoned so that you can be towed home. But wait, there's more. At 7.20 p.m. on the evening of June 4th, trying to snatch victory from defeat, Yamamoto orders four Japanese heavy cruisers to bombard Midway's two islands in the middle of the night. But just after midnight on the 5th, realizing, I don't know why he realized this then, but he did, that the four carriers would be in range of American planes before reaching Midway, he cancels the order and directs them to leave the area. However, at about 2.30 in the morning on the 5th, nighttime, spooked by a US submarine, the four departing cruisers change course in the night. This results in a major collision between the Makuma and the Mogami. 40 feet of Mogami's bow is bent sideways, turning her graceful bow into the seaborne equivalent of a snowplow and reducing her speed to about 13 miles an hour. The less severely damaged Nakuma is ordered to escort Mogami as she continues her escape. By early June 5th, all of the Japanese carriers are gone, either sunk or scuttled with Japanese torpedoes from, from destroyers to keep them out of the hands of the Americans. Of course, Truance doesn't know this, nor does Simard on Midway. The Catalina search planes are back in action, eventually finding these two somewhat damaged cruisers. The few attacking, surviving attack planes on Midway are dispatched to go after them, but they have no success. The two operating US carriers, Enterprise and Hornet, launch an afternoon attack where they think, to where they think the Hear You might still be afloat. Hear You, of course, is gone. So the various planes go after a single Japanese destroyer, but everything they drop misses too. On the 6th, the US carriers again go after the Makuma and the Mogami, still struggling to leave the battle zone. This time they don't miss. This is the, one of the most famous photographs of all World War II, the Makuma after being attacked on the 6th. Mogami is hit with two bombs, the Makuma with five and some near misses. This ship is wrecked beyond belief. The torpedo she carried as a warship began exploding and she sinks early evening of the 6th. Mogami, for her part, survives, gets back, undergoes major repairs for nearly two years. And then two years later, it sunk the Battle of Leyte Gulf in 1944. But what of the Yorktown? Its crew undertaking repairs throughout the 5th and 6th. 
It looked like she might get home. But early on the 7th, the Japanese submarine, the I-168, hits her and an accompanying destroyer with three torpedoes. The destroyer is cut in half. Yorktown's crew is yet again ordered to abandon ship. The Japanese fleet is continuing to repeat westward. And Spruance knows the further west he proceeds in chasing them, the closer he gets to land-based Japanese planes and possibly the heavy cannons of Yamamoto's battleships. On the afternoon of the 6th, he orders all ships to proceed to Pearl Harbor. The Battle of Midway is effectively over. But not without one last act. Very early on the morning of June 7th, Yorktown finally sinks. The losses of the four heavy carriers was a national disaster for the Imperial Japanese Navy. It was unable to complete another similar sized carrier until 1944, while the US was turning out huge numbers of carriers, in all 10 times what the Japanese were able to build. Japan simply didn't have the manufacturing base to compete. Now, one of the myths surrounding Midway is that the Japanese lost almost all of its skilled pilots and aircrew with the sinking of the carriers. But in fact, it was the subsequent grinding campaign around Guadalcanal in the second half of 1942 that killed many more of these talented airmen. The real harm for Midway from a personnel perspective was the deaths of the skilled mechanics, engineers, maintenance crew that made the mobile striking force so effective as a fighting system. It was simply impossible for the Japanese Navy to replace these talented men. And one final, very much unintended, but important result of the Battle of Midway. We haven't talked about the Japanese assault on the Aleutians. Japanese there were successful in capturing those two islands I showed you earlier, Hatu and Kiska, way out on the uh, western part of the chain. During the fighting near Fetch Harbor, which is an American base many hundreds of miles to the east of Atu and Kiska, a pilot of a lightly damaged Japanese zero, Koga Karayoshi, had mistaken a bog on nearby Hakutan Island for a place to land his crippled plane. The zero hit, the, knee, the wheel stuck in the mud, and the plane flipped over, Koga breaking his neck in the process. A month later, the virtually undamaged plane was discovered by a Catalina, and a salvage crew recovered the nearly intact zero. Restored to flying condition, the picture in the lower left shows it, uh, the zero became a test bed for US aeronautical engineers who quickly ferreted out the zero strengths and weaknesses. This information helped them to design the next generation of US carrier naval fighters, such as the F-6F, the Hellcat, shown here in the lower right, that could now take on the zero even in dogfight. The zero no longer reigned supreme. So one of the myths of Midway. I've discussed some of them during this presentation. But in my view, the most troublesome myth of all is the idea that the US Navy won in the face of overwhelming odds. US victory was no miracle. There were more Jap US planes than Japanese. You add in Midway, it was 350 to 225. To be sure, most of the Japanese planes were in fact superior to their US counterparts. And Japanese carrier operations were clearly faster and better organized than the Americans. In many cases, Japanese carrier pilots were far more experienced than their US counterparts. The US victory was the result of a sensible and well-craft ambush plan, a dollop of good luck, and most importantly, a refusal to quit attacking, even when American planes were being slaughtered along with their Midway counterparts, Waldron, Lindsay, and Massey led incredibly brave pilots who kept pressing on. 
all while watching their compatriots get shot out of the sky. Their sacrifice made it possible for the dive bombers to wreak their terrible vengeance on the morning of June 4th. But while no miracle, the Battle of Midway certainly could have been lost by the US Navy. Supposing McCluskey doesn't notice the Arashi heading northward to home, or if Dick Best doesn't break off the, his attack, attack uh, to hit and eventually sink the Akagi with just the one bomb. Maybe the inevitable Japanese counterattack with more carriers sinks more than just the Yorktown. These what ifs always are entertaining, but ultimately they're not important. The fact was the US did win. And as Nimitz Riley commented later, the defeat of the Japanese fleet meant that the US was midway to our objective, victory in the Pacific. There was to be much horrendous fighting to come on land and on the ground and at sea. But from midway on, the US was on the offensive and the Japanese on the defensive permanently. That was the significance of the Battle of Midway and why I have been fascinated with it for all of my adult life. Thanks for your attention. And I got done with four minutes to spare. Plenty of time for questions, if there are any. If anyone has any questions, I would just unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask. Far away. Um, Greg, actually, maybe you could stop sharing your screen so that we can see if see everybody a little uh, bit easier. That might be helpful. That's fine. Uh, let me just say one thing about this picture you see. Uh, this is the uh, Yorktown at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and one point I, I, I meant to make and I forgot. You'll notice that there's a, looks like there's some strange things going on on the side here. When they those guys were sent on back on board to try to restore it, to allow her to be towed back to Pearl. They cut away a large number of the anti-aircraft guns and placements along the side of the ship. And that's what you're seeing there. All right, uh, stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Not a question, but a great presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Tom, uh, Tom Coriano from Mechanicville, and I, I agree the presentation was awesome and um, really liked your uh, bringing in the clocks. <laughs> uh, putting it into that perspective was, was uh, really enlightening because uh, most of my reading and understanding was, you know, is almost as uh, individual attempts and attacks and whatever. Um, so putting it in that time frame uh, really put a nice perspective on it. Really appreciate that. I did this presentation for the very first time when 2009, uh, I had first moved to Sheffield, Massachusetts. That's how Kim found me. Uh, and uh, I did the, do any of you know Dewey Hall in uh, Sheffield? Mm. It's an old building, uh, has a single big area. Uh, and it had a big clock and I used the clock. Every time it, something changed in the presentation, I just moved the dials of the clock. So uh, thank you. I think, I think the, the, the emphasis on time uh, and the pressures that, uh, uh, that were faced by all of these commanders, Nugumo in particular, uh, is important to understand. Yeah, I agree. The other, the other thing, since nobody else is jumping in on this, is that you know, this the whole concept of um, the the miracle and the luck and all of that. Um, all of that obviously played a part, but the the determination, dedication, the bravery of the men who flew those planes and attacked the Japanese carriers is is just such an awesome thing to, to try to get your head around. Um, they, they, went, they went into um, their uh, torpedo attacks and their uh, dive bombing attacks 
as you've pointed out, seeing the, the planes that preceded them being shot out of the sky. And yet they went with that determination and um, bravery to, to, to make their attacks. Uh, and that and, the accumulated total totality of all those ultimately futile attacks from a, from a damage causing perspective yeah. was to make it impossible for the Japanese to mount any sort of a counterattack until it was too late. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's some luck involved here. You, you get all these dive bombers showing up more or less at the same time. But, you know, you know, luck occurs in battle. Bad luck occurs in battle, too. Uh, the Americans certainly had a lot of bad luck. Um, anyway, point taken. Greg, why didn't our submarines play a larger role? in this? Were they just not positioned? It looked like they were positioned more to defend Hawaii than to defend Midway. Um, well, there were some submarines that were, were uh, uh, I'm not going to reopen the presentation. The, the, the Nautilus fought well. Um, it didn't, it, it, I, don't, I didn't tell you this part of the story, but uh, after the, I think it was the Akagi was essentially uh, dead in the water, burning like crazy. It got found by the Nautilus. Uh, and Brockman, the commander of the ship, launched some more torpedoes. I don't know if you know, know this story, but American torpedoes, either submarine torpedoes or aerial torpedoes, were terrible. They're constantly, uh, uh, they were slow, much slower than their Japanese. They, they did about 33 knots in the water. Some of the Japanese carriers could steam at 35 knots. They could literally run away from the torpedo. That was problem one. But more importantly, or more frequently, when the torpedo would hit a ship, it wouldn't go off. Apparently, there was something wrong with the, the firing mechanism. Uh, and it's a scandal in my mind. Uh, submarine commanders would come back to Pearl saying, hey, my torpedoes don't work. Uh, dive, uh, torpedo bombers would say the same thing. And the people who were responsible for developing torpedoes back in Washington said, oh, you're all wrong. It's, it's your fault. You didn't do it right. And eventually, the problem was discovered and you know, better torpedoes came along. In the case of Brockman, he launched some torpedoes at the, the dead in the water of uh, Akagi. One of them hit, didn't go off. The warhead, the front of the torpedo, uh, broke off, sank. Of course, it was heavier. The much lighter uh, motor and, and housing behind it floated. And some of the Japanese uh, crewmen who had fallen into the water once the, sh the ship was doomed, the Akagi was doomed, used it as a flotation device. Uh, the other Japanese, the other American sub that was involved was the one that spooked those uh, four, four Japanese cruisers. The guy who was in command of that uh, uh, submarine did a lousy job of letting Spruance know what was out there, and it delayed the next day's attacks. Uh, he did just a terrible job of Nimitz, who, as I mentioned, was a submariner at heart, having, having started his service uh, in the submarines, fired him. He didn't go out in any more cruises as a commander of a submarine. The other submarines didn't do anything. But in fairness, neither did the Japanese, other than, than the one that sank, the, uh, ultimately sank the uh, York. Well, thank you. This was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, Kim, I think maybe we're done. I, I don't want to cut this off. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. I love the subject, as you can tell. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.